Hi everybody. Today we're going to talk about color vision theories in the visual processing system. And at the end of this video you want to make sure you understand the difference between trichromatic theory and opponent processing theory. These are often confused term pairs in AP Psychology. We're going to talk a little bit about color blindness and we're going to talk about additive and subtractive color mixing probably in the next video and color constancy. So today uh, you want to look at trichromatic theory, opponent processing theory, and color blindness. So let's get started. We're going to talk about trichromatic theory first, and sometimes you'll see this theory referred to as the Young-Hemholtz theory of color vision. Trichromatic meaning three color theory. And the trichromatic theory attempts to explain color visual processing as really beginning in the retina, in the back of the eye, in the layer of rods and cones. And we're going to be talking about cones today. So this theory suggests that the retina contains three really different types of cones. Some of those cones are most sensitive to long wavelengths of light, or the color red. Some are most sensitive to medium wave, or short wavelengths of color, which are blue, short and blue. And some are most sensitive to medium wavelengths, or the color green. What that means is that if these three color sensitive cones are stimulated in varying ratios, that will create any color combination that the human eye can detect. And some research, researchers suggest we can perceive over a million different hues or colors on the visual spectrum. So when red, green, and blue are the primary colors of visible light rays, according to our trichromatic theory. Now this graph represents the sensitivity in nanometers of each of our cones. And remember nanometers are how we measure the wavelength of the visual light spectrum. And that varies from 400 nanometers, which would be considered short wavelengths, to 700 nanometers, which would be considered long wavelengths. So we have three color sensitive cones, some most sensitive to short wavelengths, some most sensitive to medium, and some most sensitive to red or long wavelengths. So what if a wavelength entered our eye and made it to the back of our retina and was about, say, 575 nanometers? Well, we would perceive that wavelength as yellow because we'd have red cones firing, but we would also have green cones firing, not at their maximum rate, but you know, at a fairly high level. And when we see red, our red cones and our green cones are firing at the same spot, we tend to perceive the color yellow. Now what if a wavelength came in and it was very short wavelength? Let's say this wavelength was firing, let's say 425 nanometers. The blue cones would be very um, firing at a very rapid rate but also the green cones would be firing at a minimum rate. We would perceive this to be um, violet or purplish in color. And what if a wavelength came in, say at about 480 or 485 nanometers, we'd have the green cones would be firing. The blue cones would also be firing at almost at an equal rate, but notice the red cones would also be firing. So all three color sensitive cones would be firing in this spot and that would cause us to perceive a blue-green color. And that is how we can see any of the colors along this visual spectrum. Now, we're gonna play with this in class tomorrow, but I took a couple slides from a color vision simulator, and each of these represents over here uh, the amount of color light that I can send into this person's, this animated person's eye. And here we're having red, blue and green color sensitive cones firing at their maximum rate. Notice in the brain and our visual cortex what we perceive if all three of these color sensitive cones are firing at their maximum rate. We perceive the color white. So white is basically created because of all the wavelengths, um, all the cones firing at their maximum rate. What if only the medium wavelength cones are firing at maybe uh, 80 or 85 percent of their maximum rate, the short wavelengths are not firing and the, the long wavelength uh, cones are not firing. We perceive kind of a dark green 
And think about what we would, we would see if we were perceiving the color yellow, what color sensitive cones would be firing. You, hopefully you were right, we'd have red color sensitive cones firing at a maximum rate and green color sensitive cones firing at their maximum rate because we have long wavelengths coming, coming in and medium wavelengths coming in, we perceive the color yellow. So this is how we perceive um, color according to the trichromatic theory, and we'll play with that simulator a little bit tomorrow. What about color blindness? What about the inability to see color? Does that really exist? Um, well, people can be color deficient, but they're not likely color blind, which means they have limited color, uh, color vision. And about 1 in 50 people are color deficient, and they tend to be male, and they tend to be red they tend to be red-green colorblind, which means they're lacking either red or green color-sensitive cones, or could be both. And it's impossible for them, or virtually impossible for them, to distinguish between reds and greens because they're going to look the same. Now, how do we test this? Well, many of you are probably familiar with the famous color vision test from a, when you were a child. Um, you see these blotches of dots of varying green and yellow greenish colors. Uh, and if you're colorblind, you would not see a numeral being presented in this blotch of colors. You would just see um, red, or excuse me, you would just see green and yellow green dots. But if you have normal color vision, you're going to see a particular numeral that uh, is presented here because. A numeral is presented in red dots and orange dots instead of green dots. But if you're red, green, colorblind, these dots would all look the same to you. Now in this diagram here, we have normal color vision on the left and what it would look like to see uh, jelly beans intermixed. We have green and red and blue and orange and yellow jelly beans here. But if somebody was red, green, colorblind, this is what those same jelly beans would look like. So notice the reds and the oranges um, seem to disappear. Um, the yellows would still look fairly similar, um, but the greens and the, the oranges and the reds would be indistinguishable. Now opponent processing is another color theory that attempts to explain why yellow looks like a pure color even to people who are red, green, colorblind, and it attempts to explain color after images, okay? The trichromatic theory cannot explain that. So this theory, remember an opponent is somebody who's fighting for dominance. And if you think of these opponents as like boxers and they're trying to knock the other color out. And this theory proposed by Ewald Herring suggests that after signals leave the cones, color is processed in the ganglion cells in opponent pairs. Those pairs are always the same pairs. They're either red or green pairs, blue or yellow pairs, black and white pairs. For example, some ganglion cells in an opponent processing pair are stimulated or excited by red and they're inhibited by green. So if there's more red signals coming into that opponent pair, we will see red and green will be turned off. Others are stimulated or excited by yellow or inhibited by blue, or they could be inhibited by yellow and excited by blue. So just remember the opponent pairs, you have to know these pairs, red, green, blue, yellow, black, and white. Now the opponent processing theory proposed by Herring um, this is a diagram that helps you visualize it. Remember, these are the cones, red, long wavelengths, green, medium wavelengths, and blue, short wavelengths, and how they feed into the ganglion cells. Now, this is a blue-yellow pair. So what if more blue-on color uh, pairs were being sent to this pair and less red and green? Well, then the yellow would shut off. The yellow would be turned off or inhibited, and blue would take up this whole space. But if more red and green were coming into this opponent pair, yellow would take over and blue would be inhibited, okay? Same with the red-green pair or the black and white pair. 
Now we're going to attempt to explain color after images here. And we can explain after image with this. So let's say we stare at a red triangle. That means in our opponent sensitive pair back here, we're staring at a, a, a red triangle, more red signals are coming into this area than green. So green is shut off and red is turned on. Now, sensory adaptation would suggest that if we stared at that red triangle for too long, uh, the red, we wouldn't be able to see red and we'd see green in its process. Because in these opponent pairs, follow me here, in these opponent pairs, one of the other color is going to fire. But if we're staring at one of those colors for too long, the brain will still hold that color, um, that color image constant because vision is so important, um, even though those cells are being fatigued. But what if we look away from that color? What if we look away at a white wall? Well, we're going to see what happens in a minute, okay? So the opponent processing also explains why yellow is a pure color because if red and green signals are coming in to the same opponent processor, yellow will turn on and blue will turn off. And yellow looks like a pure color. It doesn't look like a mixture of red and, and green. But what about this um, after image? Remember, oh, I forgot about this. Hold on. Remember, people who are red, green, colorblind, they can't distinguish between these two colors. Those images will still feed in to the blue-yellow opponent processors, and that means we can still see yellow. Now here's how an after image works. If we're staring at an image, let's say a, a red triangle, our brain will hold that image, that red triangle image constant. But if we look away from the red triangle and we look at a white wall, that white wall means we're seeing equal amounts of red and green. Uh, remember if we see red, green, and blue in the same spot, we perceive white. But if we fatigue those red cones, we see those red um, sensitive cones, red cannot fire in that its place, we'll see the opponent processing cell fire in its absence because in the processing cell and the opponent processors, red or green has to fire blue or yellow has to fire uh, black or white has to fire. If we, for, if we fatigue the red and green, blue will be an uh, after image. If we, fatigue, if we fatigue just the red cells and we look at a white wall, there'll be too much green firing, so we'll see a green after image. So the after image is always the opposite opponent processor. If we're staring at yellow, blue will be the after image. If we're staring at green, red will be the after image. If we're staring at um, green, red will be the after image. If we're staring at blue, yellow will be the after image. So what I want you to do uh, you're going to pause this video and you're going to stare at these three little dots here, the red, uh, the green, and the blue dot for 45 seconds. So you're going to have to time yourself. And then at that, after 45 seconds is up, while you're still pausing the video, blink and look at this little plus sign and blink off and on there for a couple seconds and you'll see an after image of this picture. Okay? So go ahead and do that. I'm going to move on. Um, Go ahead. So you're back. Hopefully that was a cool after image for you. Which theory is correct? Um, they're both correct. Um, both theories explain color vision. Uh, the trichromatic theory works best when you're explaining the cones. The trichromatic, or excuse me, the opponent process theory, processing theory works best when you're explaining color processing outside of the cones, in the ganglion cells, and in the brain. Combining the two theories creates a more complete picture of color vision processing. So we're going to stop there. Um, please review and be able to explain how after images take place and the difference between the two color vision theories. And we'll talk later.